tonight's discussion. Why digital making is so important, why Nomnet Trust has commissioned a review of the latest work and research, and why uh, we are also working with uh, Mozilla and Nesta to bring together industry and academia, social enterprise and policy makers to inspire a new generation of digital creators. As you can tell, I'm all about the why. I've, um, I've just spent the weekend with my three-year-old goddaughter who is just at that stage. Why? Why does it snow? Why is Iggle Piggle blue? Why does um, Turbo have a wet nose? You, you get the drift. Um, what I love about the digital world is that it really encourages us to ask the question why, to challenge our assumptions and to stretch our thinking. Why do so many of us still commute to an office? I think something that may be front of mind for a lot of Yahoo employees at the moment. Um, but why, why also don't we better organize our resources in communities so that we can care for the elderly and infirm in their own homes? Why do so many of our formal education structures still um, base themselves around one teacher at the front of a classroom dishing out predetermined facts? Like me with my goddaughter, you can probably answer the first follow-up why, maybe the second, but if you're beginning to struggle with the third and the fourth, we really need to start rethinking how we go about things. And what we're finding is already that digital technology is challenging traditional structures. It's creating new forms of employment. It's setting out new kinds of learner-centered education and new ways of engaging in socially useful activities. But with so much change going on with the digital world, it's vital that we all have a critical awareness of digital technology's potential, both the negative and the positive. We all need to know how technologies work. We all need to understand how the value systems of designers help shape some of the tools that we use. And we need to understand how digital technologies can help us create the kind of world that we want to live in. When you think about it, the internet of things, net neutrality, um, filter bubbles, the impact of smart machines on employment, there is so much that we still have to discover and um, describe and, and decide upon as we begin to find our way in what is still a very new digital age. So from privacy to civil liberties, from uh, intellectual property to the ethics of commerce, there are vital questions that we need to address around the, the intersection between technology and society. Um, and so, I guess you guys know all this stuff, but what perhaps you're not so aware of, what we're not so aware of, is that um, there are actually only a very small proportion of people who are sustained and developed digital makers. That is, creators of new technology, whether that's um, apps or websites or hardware or games. Um, and that includes young people, despite the misconceptions that all young people are sophisticated and savvy digital producers. A recent YouGov um, poll suggested that 75% of young people were interested in um, becoming digital creators to creating um, projects online. But, and also 67% wanted to learn to program and to code, but actually only 3% knew how, 3%. So we do need to be careful. We need to recognize that the, we are only often talking about very exceptional cases. So at Nominate Trust, what we're really interested in doing is looking at the motivations and the barriers to young people becoming digital makers. How, what are the, the blocks, what are the triggers, and how can we encourage more young people to engage and move from casual use to much deeper engagement. And that is why we've collaborated with uh, Mozilla and with Nesta to um, collate and also um, promote some of the resources, the activities, the um, tools that are often quite disparate and try to encourage more young people to become digital creators. What we're also interested in looking at is the progression in digital making, when so much of the, the development of skills happens between a range of environments, from home and school and, and back again. We're also looking at how a key feature of, of digital making, as we all know, is that it's collaborative and it's social in nature. And with people working online very comfortable with 
thinking in public and sharing and working with people that they don't know. And while we're seeing that young people are very comfortable with that notion when they're out of school and they seek out information from their own networks of resources and people to get the information that's relevant to them, whether that's um, how to get to the next level of a, a massively multiplayer game or whether it's um, how to change the inner tube on their bike, they're very comfortable with finding the information that they need. <coughs> But how can schools also draw on some of those features of, of online collaborative communities um, that are already proving themselves to be such powerful learning environments? Digital making is also about analysis, about problem solving, about creative thinking, and about persistence, and which are all vital skills in a labor market that's rapidly changing and needing people who are self-reliant and self-motivated and who um, yeah, are creative. And so how might, by supporting digital making, might we encourage more people um, different kinds of learning across the, the curriculum? As um, MIT's Seema Papad would have it, um, making is a far better way of understanding than simple instruction. So by supporting digital making, how might we encourage a deeper engagement, as I say, across the curriculum? So lots of questions. And, um, no doubt that engaging young people to become active and informed uh, participants in a digital society is a significant, it's an urgent, and it's a complex task, which is why we've asked Julian Sefton Green to map the digital landscape. Because what we hope to do is to be able to highlight what we know about young people's digital making, but importantly, what we don't know and what can't be claimed. Because if we are going to encourage young people to understand digital technologies and fulfill their positive potential, we do need to be clear about the evidence that we're building on and also to ask more nuanced questions that help us determine where new projects, new research, new funding can be focused. So when you think about it, the lasting innovations in science, in art, in thought, whether it's um, Copernicus or Einstein or James Joyce or Bob Dylan, they all come from a break with the principles of the past. And what's so exciting about digital technology is that it encourages us to do just that, to challenge the status quo and to think differently about how we want to structure our society. But if we're going to do that, we need to equip young people with those skills to use technology not just to answer and address the problems that we have today, but also to identify and solve new and emerging problems, to be persistent askers of the question why, or perhaps more relevantly, to, as they analyze vast data sets and come up with new solutions, to ask the question, why not? Why not? Why don't we try it this way? So lots of questions, as I say, and I think we can look forward to a really stimulating conversation. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Dan Such, Head of Development Research at Nominet Trust, who is going to lead us through tonight's discussion. Yeah. Outstanding. Thank you very much, Annika. And thank you, everyone, for, for turning up today. A Annika's right. There are lots of really fascinating questions around digital making. Uh, I was going to use that as an excuse to introduce the panel uh, to, as these wise folk to help us answer them. But just looking around the room, there are so many people here who are already doing this stuff, who are thinking long and hard about digital making. So. If nothing else, I hope you enjoy the opportunity to talk over a glass of wine and share some ideas. Well, I hope before we get to that, and I hope you already have your wine glasses in hand, we can talk with, with this group first about some of the issues that are emerging. I came across a wonderful phrase recently, which was, it works in practice, but it, we can't make it work in theory. And, and one of the things that's fascinating around digital making is there are so many great examples of supporting young people as digital makers, whether it's young rewired states supporting, pe supporting young people to put digital making skills into practice, whether it's code a club, uh, a code they go supporting young people for the first time to learn how to code, whether it's using things from uh, great products from technology will save us, whether it's learning computational skills from apps for good. There are so many great examples. But along with those examples, there's a growing need, to look, a recognition perhaps, that digital making underpins so many of the challenges we're facing. If we can understand how to develop technologies, also understand how to use other people's technologies, it's a really important skill set to support young people. And because there's that understanding, that demand, it means we need to understand how digital making can be fostered across other areas, not just the brilliant examples going on now, 
but how digital making fits within schools, how it fits within homes, how it fits within social spaces and individual work as well. And so understanding some of the concepts that fit underneath digital making and how we best support young people is one of the key steps in understanding how we help grow and get more and more young people engaged in these sorts of activities. So to get to that point, we need not just for it to work in practice, but to understand some of the theories that fit underneath it and where some of those theories had come from before as well. So it's with that kind of challenge in mind that we've been very welcome, thank you, very lucky to work with Julian over the past few months as he's put together this review of digital making to understand some of the histories behind it, some of the context in which it sits. So in a few minutes, I'm going to hand over to Julian and ask him just to talk about some of those key concepts, some of the key issues that emerge from the report. Before that, I'm going to introduce the wonderful panel we have to talk with today as well. We have Dr. Joe Twist, uh, who's CEO of Yuki. We have um, Ben Southworth, Deputy CEO of UK, uh, of the Tech City Investment Organization, and uh, Miles Berry, who until Saturday was chair of Nexus. That's right. <laughs> Has now relieved that, relieved that role, yes. Uh, still a senior lecturer at Roehampton. All of whom have got fascinating insight into different aspects of digital making and digital technologies. So I'm hoping it's going to be a really rich discussion at the front, even more so when, when you'll get involved with some questions and some comments afterwards. But once again, thank you all for coming today. Julian, if I can ask you to, to outline some of the areas from your report. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much, Annika. <coughs> thank you very much to Nominate Trust. And thank you very much to all of you for being here. Um, I've been offered 10 minutes to try and give some sort of summary of um, the paper that you'll all devour eagerly on the tube on the way home, I dare say. So, and I want to kind of talk through kind of um, a bit why I wanted to do this, what, were the, what I'm interested in <coughs> to try and help contextualize um, some of the discussion in it. So as the title uh, implies, it's an attempt to kind of um, over-ambitiously map the theory, practice, and policies that, understand, that underpin our understanding of digital makers and digital making, which is a kind of vast terrain. And I kind of wanted to do that deliberately because I'm always struck by the way in which sets of arguments that have a particular historical uh, position and, a his <coughs> and relate to certain kinds of theories of learning or certain kind of social practices get imported into um, whatever is the kind of flavor of the month. And in some senses, digital making, whilst undoubtedly important, also occupies that position in that sense. Secondly, I was particularly interested in the history and the sort of life course approach to understanding how young people get engaged with, get rejected by, get involved with, drop out of, um, participation in a range of kind of creative digital activities. And I'm interested in thinking very much about the day-to-day -day practice of young people's lives, of which schooling is, of course, a very important part and other forms of education, but to try and kind of mesh our understanding of those larger trajectories, those larger routes, um, and those larger kind of contexts that kind of pull into the kind of discussion that we're particularly focused on. Um, and kind of thirdly, um, I'm interested in bringing together um, very diverse kind of sets of interests, and that's kind of reflected in the three substantive chapters that comprise the report. So the, the three areas that I tried to focus on was one, studies of young people and what they kind of get up to by themselves with peers um, and relatively informally in families. Um, secondly, looking at curriculum initiatives, and but that in itself um, isn't quite so straightforward because curriculum just, of course, just doesn't just mean school. It also means the range of other semi-formal, informal, and non-formal learning opportunities that young people will get engaged in at various stages of their lives. And then thirdly, I wanted to try and intertwine this with some of the imaginary and um, aspirational ideals that come through policy rhetoric. We know that this is a particular field that is being uh, fought over in policy terms at the moment, and that's um, in a way how it should be, but it also reflects the way that different kind of policy imaginaries inflect this whole field of young people's creative digital activities um, with different kind of um, aspirations. Um, and also I'm interested in the way that different kind of institutions, people with different kind of backgrounds, which is clearly reflected in the room here today, coming from different kind of institutions, um, also kind of come together with their own sets of interests without perhaps realizing what people from other histories and other institutions will bring with them to the kind of table. So the, the second chapter in the review looks at um, people in everyday life and the kind of studies that we have of hobbies, interests, and enthusiasms which sounds a sort of 
a very kind of matter of fact and quotidian kind of way to kind of get going. Um, but the truth of the matter is that we don't actually have um, a lot of understanding about um, the ways that young people might become engaged in creative activities. There aren't that many studies. There are virtually no longitudinal, uh, long-term kind of studies of young people as they move their way through um, either successfully or unsuccessfully, depending on how we define those various kinds of digital activities. Um, we don't tend to track people between school and other kinds of learning domains, despite the fact that everybody pays lip service to learning being a kind of ecological argument in which everybody is embedded. There are very few kind of research studies which have the wit or the um, initiative or the kind of funding to be able to follow and track people through um, a diverse experiences as they grow up um, in their lives. So one kind of key argument there is, is that we need different kinds of research which is going to have to be imaginative and it's going to have to be funded in different kinds of ways that can explore the sort of catalysts and disconnects in young people's lives. Um, because the key thing, it seems to me, is to come to some understanding about the nature of the progression in people's learning, young people's learning, as they engage with and develop their experiences across a range of media. We don't even really have a terribly um, attenuated understanding of the ways in which people's creative activities in specific media with their own historical, um, their own kind of, hist their own histories like how, you, like film or music or writing, you know, old fashioned things like that, how they're kind of um, integrated in and um, synthesized and remixed and reworked in the new kinds of forms of producing that are at the heart of digital creativity. So both from the point of view of looking at young people and the different kind of ways in which they come into the creative activities, and also the way that the different disciplines themselves are of creative making is an, is an incredible state of flux and change, both drawing on older guild disciplines, but also creating new forms. These are kind of things that we need to look at in different kinds of ways. The second substantive chapter looks at what I call curriculum interventions and innovations. And there I tried to track and break out, break down um, initiatives that people might undertake by themselves or with friends and informally. And we, we, there's a lot of excitement around um, learning moments, kind of key episodes in kids' lives or all of our lives where you kind of get to grips with something new. But again, there isn't a, uh, the, the mechanisms to kind of track and trace the way that those kind of episodes and key moments might interlink with other kinds of knowledge and other kinds of experiences. Um, but a lot of the innovative and exciting digital making activities are available online, but it's not clear how you could build on those and take them elsewhere. The second kind of area in this kind of category of curriculum is what is the sort of out of school, non-formal community based kinds of learning. And the third is obviously debates about the curriculum itself. I don't particularly want to get into that, which is uh, more other colleagues expertise here at, at this particular point in time. But it's not, what I do want to say is that I'd, if we just limit the debate to focusing on what the, the formal curriculum issues are, we kind of exclude a huge amount of the important discussion um, involved in trying to understand digital making more kind of um, conceptually and generally. Um, the third kind of substantive chapter looks at um, what I call sort of policy aspirations. Um, and I think here, even in this kind of area, there are the, this field of digital making brings together three discrete and separate traditions which don't really talk to each other. I think we can trace some of the language from a concern with creativity in the creative and cultural industries. We can trace an important kind of theme around the becoming of becoming digital citizens and informed consumers coming out of um, a whole other set of discourses. And then thirdly, a whole set of interests around work, skills, competence, computers, and of course economic growth. And it seems to me that the kinds of policies that we're accustomed to in this country that um, derive from a particular kind of sectoral interest um, don't always come together in a very educational sense or with a great interest in education when it comes to kind of considering all of those sorts of things. Um, what kicked me off uh, with the whole thing were big questions about the relationship between kind of learning and the economy because there can be no doubt that some of the current interest in digital making and the, this particular kind of initiative comes from a particular some would say nostalgic and others would, would say prospective kind of desire to kind of recreate a certain kinds of uh, of growth 
and we wanted um, to know what kind of evidence exists to explain the relationship between qualifications, training routes, and employment, with a particular interest in the ways in which a broad notion of digital making experiences might impact on and be affected by changes in the economy and production practices. Secondly, as I've already implied, we wanted to explore understandings of how people develop expertise, experience, and skills in digital making. We have very little sense of how this comes about and how these capabilities might develop across the life course trajectories. And I guess in general, I looked at the literature which explored young people from sort of um, roundabout, I'm not really into developmentalist stages, and I think that's a whole category that gets challenged by the digital anyway. But broadly speaking, over sort of 10, 15 years, from sort of 10 to 25 kind of thing, which I think is where it all happens. Um, and uh, also the relationship between other broader interest in digital making which stem from a concern with civics, which stem from a concern with um, participation, uh, which is a, a word that's often used in um, American literature around kind of youth and, and the digital uh, and community. Um, so what did I find out or what did I claim that the research said um, and what we do know and what we don't know, which was in a sense, part of the more modest aims that lies behind, lies, lay behind the review, even if the kind of field itself is more ambitious than that. So I think we, I could say with some certainty that research tends to cluster around an interest in the expressive and civic dimensions of participation in digital cultures. There's quite a lot written about that. Um, but this doesn't, um, this doesn't really explore the relationship between um, the more creative possibilities afforded by technology and actual day-to-day -day usage. So with all the emphasis on kind of cultural and expressive uses, it's not that detailed in um, more analyzing and understanding creative uh, potentials. In terms of the focus on curriculum, and remember I was trying to get at a sense of curriculum relating to both out-of-school and in-school um, organizations, I think there is a, a range of different educational philosophies and theories of learning underpinning both policy and practice-led interventions um, across all, the domain, all these um, domains. Uh, and I think there are two questions here. One is a question about what constitutes the specifics of digital creativity, both in relationship to the medium and the convergence of older and other interdisciplinary creative uh, traditions. And secondly, there are different models of learning at work across different kinds of initiatives. So when people tend to lump together digital making initiatives, there may be very different kinds of senses of outcomes or experiences that are implied um, in the bundling together of those ideas. And in terms of the policy debate, um, whilst there can be no doubt that digital creativity, digital making and participation are key concerns for social, economic and political policy, um, but the fields um, and the fields preoccupy teachers, learners and families in different ways, um, it's quite extraordinary how the different fields don't really talk to each other. So you'll have policy in one kind of area relating to kind of developing a computer literate workforce, if you saw what I mean. And then you'll have kind of what people are trying to do in schools, and then you'll have policy relating to creative and cultural industries. And that if you look at the kind of range of bodies that are charged with responsibility over these areas, they don't tend to talk to each other in this way. And it's quite extraordinary, given everybody seems to claim that the digital is the way forward, how, how, how little... Uh, common ground there is in that kind of area. So I end up making three key recommendations which may or may not interest you as a kind of focus for discussion here. The first one of um, these is um, a need to focus on exploring and reconceptualizing digital creativity or digital making or digital literacy. Now I'm a bit agnostic about which term you want to use and I think there may be some merit. Um, people have been very vexed by digital literacy for example as a term all of these words carry a particular baggage with them and often get in the way of furthering debate. Um, but we need some kind of way of bridging um, digital making as a kind of integrated concept in that way. Um, the second kind of recommendation is that we need a, um, work which can model growth, development, and progression in creative people or people engaged in making and devising as they move across and between different life course experiences participating in digital creativity. And we need to particularly focus on barriers, trajectories, routes, R-O-U-T-E-S, as well as R-O-T-S, 
catalysts and disconnects that enable or hinder individuals to continue to develop. We have very little sense of, the kind of that kind of mapping. And the third kind of um, recommendation is that we need, I mean, I don't want to just sound like some crusty old academic recommending more research, but we need different kinds of systematic accounts of learning around digital creativity, um, particularly those which focus on learning in different kinds of educational contexts. So if you think of an educational context with a lowercase e, i.e. what people are learning at home or what people learn with their friends and things like that, there's very little research which, I mean, it's difficult. Uh, I won't pretend otherwise. There, there is little research which kind of investigates this learning across and between kind of ways. So rather than just accounts of more learning um, in the same kind of location, we need, uh, we need other kinds of research which can capture and, and look at what, how people learn outside school with their friends in different kinds of social relationships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, alongside and intertwined with what's on offer in schools um, and schooling and other forms of training and university learning. So those were my three, um, that's what I think the research, the, my reading of the evidence takes us to, and um, I'll call a halt there and look forward to the uh, opening this out for discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. It, you know, it, it's a fascinating report because it, it, it touched on a number of different areas around digital making. We've been working with uh, Mozilla and Nesta for the past year, and when we're talking about the importance of digital making, we talk about the, the economic imperative, of course, the way in which digital making skills can lead to, to potential future prosperity, future, future jobs and, and businesses. We talk about the, the personal creativity that you talk about, the way in which you can use digital technologies to, to be creative in, in new ways. But we also talk about in terms of the ways in which you can participate in new ways and understanding how the technological infrastructure and structures that, that um, shape the way in which we work, by understanding that we can shape and we, we can participate more effectively. So I'm going to come to, to Miles in a moment. One of the things that fascinates me, Julie, about the report is the way in which this is a really contested area. There are lots of policy initiatives around it. There are lots of practices around it. But they come from very different trajectories and backgrounds. Can you just talk for a moment, about, again, from your report, about some of the challenges about the different histories and different trajectories and, and why that's difficult to make sense of now? Um, I think one of the key things that emerged um, <coughs> was trying to unpick the different theories of learning that underpin the different ways in which initiatives are kind of set up and evaluated. So people have very different kind of understandings of what you might learn playing with, um, what's it called, x-ray goggles or something. You know, you know the Mozilla thing where you can look at the code underneath the web page? It's a very kind of cute thing. But people have a very different understanding of what is the learning implied in that and what, how you, what you might learn from it, what you might do with that learning, and then how you put that together with, say, debates around code, you know, the current debate about coding and computer science and things like that. So I... I so um, th that's one particular kind of area. And in, in terms of the kind of policy stuff, it's, very, it's extraordinary about the focus on discrete creative and cultural sectors, for example, as opposed to kind of some um, more integrated notion of the digital. And I think thirdly, probably the, the ways in which digital creativity, and I don't know whether that's the right phrase, um, doesn't have any kind of single place in, in a lot of kind of curriculum spaces. So, so let's take that first one for a minute then. Largely, digital making activities that you reviewed have started outside of schools. Have it largely been informal, self-starting individuals? Is that what you, you've come across largely? Um, there's a lot of innovation there, yes. Okay. Yes. So, so I suppose the question I have, I'm going to come to you, Miles. You've been involved in, in CAS, in NACE, in uh, Open Education Resources for years. What's the integration? Well, what are the challenges then? If lots of this stuff happens outside school already, how, how do schools begin to respond to support digital making? We have a long and noble tradition, certainly in primary education, of making things, of, of craft skills, of art, of creativity in the classroom. Um, I'd hope that we can build on that. By and large, teachers feel very comfortable teaching things that they know, which is why you get art and craft and, and so on, and why when you move into a digital domain, the stuff which many teachers feel most comfortable with is, is word processing documents and producing presentation slides because that's what many teachers do day in, day out. To move into a new domain, to move beyond that level of digital creativity, it is still digital creativity, means teachers becoming more comfortable with working in 
a wider range of media, with working in animation, with working in graphics, with working in video. And to move beyond that means teachers becoming more and more comfortable with working in code and working in programming languages. These things are not beyond the teaching profession, but for an older generation of teachers, it's stuff which they're kind of less familiar with. For the new generation of teachers, I'm actually feeling really, really optimistic. I may be looking at things through, through Roehampton's rose-tinted spectacles, but you know, we do the audit when our trainees get to us. You know, what, what do you feel confident in? Where, where are your, the gaps in your skills? And yeah, many of them haven't made digital video before. Many of them have never programmed, or if they have, it was one of those lovely Roma floor turkeys, if you remember those. Um, nevertheless, they are, if you'll allow me to use the term, and there are plenty of people in the room who won't let me use the term digital natives, they've grown up since the web was around, and they have that sense of confidence and curiosity when it comes to new technology, that they're willing to learn new skills. And I think that will serve them well when it comes to getting out into schools, that that confidence of, okay, I'll have a go with something new, and more importantly, I'll let my pupils have a go at something new. So on the whole, yeah, I'm optimistic. We'll be able to move into new realms of digital creativity with a new generation of children. So, have so I answered your question? Perfectly, well, as always. Okay. Yeah. Have you come across great examples of digital making activity within formal education to date? Yeah, you're seeing a lot of it. I mean, my, my, my area of, of greatest expertise, I suppose, is the primary sector. And look at the way that the profession have taken to blogging, that you have children day in, day out, writing stuff for a global audience. You know, when I was a lad, you know, there were only two or three people who ever read the stuff that I wrote when I was at primary school. Well, with the stuff I was writing, that's, that's not surprising. These days, you've got a global audience of two billion people for the things which children are writing in primary schools. There are better examples than that, though. Look at the way that you have children creating digital media. The Manchester University um, computer animation competition. Some gorgeous work going in there, and it's not just the take a photograph, move it on, take a photograph, move it on, stop motion stuff. It's scripted animation written in languages like Scratch. I forget the number, I ought to have checked, but three million projects up there on the Scratch website, not all of which created in school, but plenty of it now created in school. That teachers are seeing this need to move to more coding, more computer science, more programming on the curriculum, and Scratch is the toolkit which so many of them are choosing to use to make that happen. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to that, but there's Fine. a lot more to talk. Before we do, I'm going to bring in Ben in a moment. There's a question about um, where this starts, the, the, the catalysts that you mentioned, and you talked about something as, as an area we need to understand in more detail. I'm going to talk about Ben, because Ben has an understanding of, kind of the tech entrepreneur boot the scene. Uh, so, I'm, I'm, uh, so I'll come to Ben and ask about where, where these entrepreneurs are coming from at the moment. But what, have, what did you see in, in your work, and what have you talked about in, t in terms of these catalysts that we know about so far? Well, the problem is that you, all you know about is when um, people who are successful and have achieved things can tell you accounts of why they were successful, right? Which is a bit of a sort of methodological cop-out. But you, all you know, you, you can, uh, there must be some people who've made things here, even here, right? And they, they will tell you very interesting stories <laughs> about the kind of moments where they gave up or where they got started and things like that and what made the difference and things like that. But we don't really know about what, what we don't, you know, it's a Rumsfeldian paradox. We don't know, it's the un unknown unknowns that we need to kind of, and get into a bit more in that kind of sense, because by definition, you only hear the stories from people who are relatively successful. So it's a, it's a, it's a good story in that kind of way. Well, well, let's stick with that theme for a minute and stick with the, the relatively successful ones or the ones who are burgeoning successful. Then f from your work, and it might be worth just explaining a little bit more about what you do. What you do. Who, 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 sorry, who are the, the tech entrepreneurs that we're seeing at the moment? That's a tough question. I mean, <clears throat> so sort of Tech City UK is, um, a government organization set up to try to encourage entrepreneurship, uh, particularly focused on the East London cluster. Um, and so in, 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 in my day in life, I, I tend to encounter quite a lot of either hope to be successful or successful entrepreneurs. Um, and it is, it's tricky, you know, there's, 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 no, there's no kind of, there's no route to success. There's no, there's no guaranteed, um, background that, that, that indicates that you will be successful as a, a tech entrepreneur. I mean, 
not only in, in Tech City, but also in the UK and, and the world. I mean, some of the greatest companies have been founded by people who, who left university and, and were college dropouts. Um, I myself have, I think I have three GCSEs total. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's not necessarily about, about kind of formalized education. I think it is, it's far more about the sort of the approach of, of the individual. I think all of the entrepreneurs that I meet are, are passionate to a fault, are creative to a fault, um, are sort of dedicated, um, you know, sort of very, very focused and, and you know, again, to, to a fault. And I think some of these people hit on, on the right problem and, and come up with the right solution. And, and whatever has been kind of worrying their head and, and bothering them, they create a great solution which they then find a way to monetize. There are many people who are worrying about problems that have no money. There are many people who are worrying about money without having a problem to solve. Um, you know, there are, there are, you know, I would love to be able to take all of them and kind of put them together into some sort of uber mensch of entrepreneurship and, and change the world. But I think, I think one of the big things is, is a dissatisfaction that, that is kind of quite palpable. A desire to sort of to change and to be different and to, to, look, at, to look at things and, and, and basically consider them idiotic um, and, and really try and rip that up. And I, you know, the, the, the point on sort of primary school learning, I mean, that was, that was the happiest for me at school, for sure. Um, you know, making, building, you know, there was no, <laughs> no necessarily rigorous analysis of what you were doing, just, you know, the occasional concern the school psychiatrist might have a strongly worded um, talk with your parents. I think it's, we need to bring back this, this, this interactivity into, into learning full stop. And, and I'm a big believer in a sort of many-to-many -many concept of multiple interactions creating much greater ideas. And I think, you know, it's kind of ludicrous for me to say this talking to you all. I think one-to-many sort of broadcast scenarios are, are unfortunately the past. And I think we've seen with the internet that people are really keen to interact with other people, disparate voices. And I think to sort of, people, people like that, that sort of storytelling piece. They like that um, multiple voices. And I think because it, you know, as Bakhtin would tell us, kind of mirrors our own sort of, our own thinking. I think we like having differing opinions. And I think that's the kind of, the interesting thing about sort of digital making is there are so many different routes that actually a child or, or, or a caregiver can, can experiment and find that, and, and the child can find that. And especially, especially youngsters, they're, they're kind of much more accepting. They're, they're, they're quite happy to be like, this isn't perfect. I'll just do, I can, I can do this and something else. You know, whereas I think when we're sort of in our careers and we're focused on stuff, we're only trying to work out what's either good for our career. And so we, we don't maybe learn the things we should learn in a way. It's fascinating talking about the, the different routes. Just looking around the audience here, uh, there, there are people from formal education, people from, from uh, startups, people from you know, uh, third sector, from business. And, and you're right, to, to, to support a, well, a generation is our aspiration of digital makers. It, it's going to take all those different routes. But the thing that's interesting is, is you talked about the things that, that begin to make uh, a successful entrepreneur. And you talked about a dissatisfaction with, with, with the current world, creativity to a fault, dedication to a fault. You didn't talk about their ability to code, or the kind of the technical stuff. So, so, so if we want people to be real digital makers, do we focus on those things, the creativity, on helping them to dedicate, to help them unpick those big world problems? Is that the focus? I think, so I, I mean, an entrepreneur for me is, is anyone who, who solves problems, and I, I guess it really doesn't really matter how you do that. I mean, sometimes just solving problems can be putting the right perfect people in the room and spending all your energy just doing that. I think. I'm, I mean, I'm a developer by sort of, by Googling, um, and I think, I think coding is, is, is important if you want to create a very strong digital output. Um, if, you're, if you care about software, then that's great. But software's really hard and actually really geeky and requires you to do all sorts of really tedious sort of things that aren't that much fun. You have to kind of worry about security and piracy and revenue models. You know, if what you want to do is, get your toaster to be able to text you when your toast is done, then you know, your, your level of coding required is, is, is fairly, fairly nominal. So it's, it's about the output, like what are you trying to achieve? Um, but I think if we, if we can teach 
people to be creative and to be hopefully dissatisfied with their world until they make it into the, the world they want. The, t the tools, you know, the, the internet is, is a tool. A computer is the world's greatest, most effective tool. And I think it's about ensuring people are comfortable with tools, not necessarily how do they build a new tool, how do they, how do they kind of smelt the oil and, and make the axe. I don't think that's necessarily the point. The point is, is can you think of a better tool? By the way, did you say ecosystem? I, I, I probably meant to, I, should I? That's brilliant. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can you clean that down? Ecosystem, <laughs> awesome. I, I should have, yes. But, so, th this has such an impact on, on the work you do uh, in terms of digital making now, but also potential future, gen uh, future digital making. Do you have a sense of, of either the skills gaps or, or the kind of support you need from, from or the sort of support that the, the young people to help the sorts of work you're doing? And again, it might be worth just introducing mm. Yuki to, to those that are here as well. Absolutely. So, uh, Yuki is UK Interactive Entertainment, so we're um, the trade body that represents, we help support, grow, promote the games and interactive entertainment. Interactive entertainment's important uh, phrase to put in there, alongside games. Um, uh, and we help uh, game developers and talent from cradle to grave, no matter what size they are, from all the young startups that are popping up, uh, focusing on tablet games, to the more traditional side of the industry, which, you know, we forget. Uh, as a nation, we were actually responsible for building. You know, the games industry is about 30 or 40 years old, and it started with those early tinkerers, with those people who were with their ZX Spectrums and their BBC Micros going, hmm. And especially <laughs> brothers and sisters, it's very interesting, the sibling rivalry. There's lots of big game studios like, the, like Blitz, um, who's run by the Oliver Twins. And they literally were rivaling each other, saying, I can code better than you. Look what I can make this do. And they ended up making their fortune and making these incredibly successful games aged 20 years old, um, 18 years old. You know, and I think their father, they tell the story of their father saying, um, you know, you, you'll have to get a job in a year if you, if you, if you don't. You, know, you have to get a proper job. And uh, as soon as they bought their first uh, racing car or sports car, whatever those things are, um, age 20, you know, said, oh, okay, then you don't need to get a another job. This is your job. Um, but we have an incredible heritage in the games industry, um, which was built on coding. And, you know, we, we at Yuki have worked very hard in the policy um, world. We do a lot of policy work, a lot of practical help, um, matchmaking companies, helping to cross-pollinate ideas and talent to find other talent, um, but also a lot of media work as well to stop the Daily Mail uh, essentially only focusing on 18-rated uh, games and thinking that it's all about violence. See the BAFTA award winners last week to realize that's not the case. Um, and we, we, you know, we've done a lot of policy work in the last year through the Next Gen Skills campaign, which um, UK members funded. And that was a cross-industry campaign, coalition, which many of you will be familiar with and were involved in. Um, and Theo, sitting at the back there, um, led on that. And that, you know, got Gove, you know, as a sort of, we were, that campaign was a funnel. You know, again, it's better collective than, you know, as a single voice, uh, as a collective, saying, shouting a message loud and clear to government to change the uh, curriculum so that boring ICT, which was just teaching kids how to learn to, to read applications as opposed to write applications, um, was just applied through that campaign and through the, the other work that lots of other people got involved in. And, you know, it's critically important, and I sort of take issue, because coding fun is fundamental, fundamental, that was really math, <laughs> but coding is fundamental to games. Games are themselves um, learning systems. You know, we talk about digital making and the process of making being very important to understanding and to learning in itself, and through experience of making something, you understand the issues of problems, you come against problems or um, decisions you have to make. In the same way, I was a, in my previous life, um, uh, sort of before I joined uh, Yuki a year ago, I was commissioning uh, content um, for education at Channel 4 um, and joined Alice Taylor and her fantastic team there. And there, the whole um, uh, budget, apart from Battlefront, which Nominet Trust also funded, was spent on games because we were trying to reach teenagers um, with life skills, uh, uh, sort of education content. And we realized, you know, 100% of kids play games. Also, the average age of the gamer in the UK is actually 33. Um, but 100% of the future rising generation play games, and it's their expectation of content. And they love 
the fact that they can actually make games. And games that we commissioned, it was all about that uh, problem solving and that sort of trial and error. You know, in order to progress through a game system, you know, through a game and through a story, you make decisions and you see the consequences of your decisions. So in that sense, I, I think games in all sorts of ways um, are fundamental to digital making and the future of digital making, but also to, um, you know, in, in terms of the kind of skill sets we need. I haven't answered the question at all. So the skill sets we need are not just the computer science uh, rigorous understanding of uh, pr a programmatic way of thinking, an algorithmic way of thinking, and a way of approaching problems, um, but also the artistic and highly creative skills. You know, our industry sits at the ne nexus between content and technology. We're both. You know, we're fundamentally software, but there are storytelling, fantastic soundscapes, and essentially essential uh, artistic skills that are required. And that's where our next kind of focus for the Next Gen Skills campaign lies. So, w within some of the, the organisations you just talked about, those that won BAFTA <laughs> awards last week, Blitz Games, mm. th there are people who aren't coders, who, who are great at music, who, who are incredible artists. Yeah. Do they need to, to, to be digital makers, as they obviously are? Do they need to understand code? Do they need to better understand how to talk to those who can code? What's you need to understand what goes into making a product, essentially. You know, and, and you know, I can't sit there and say, you know, I, I, I was thrown into my first job um, uh, and I had to learn HTML. I didn't know anything about HTML, um, but just learning that uh, basic HTML helped me to understand the process and the, and the length of time it takes. You know, and this was a, always the fundamental problem when I was, uh, I was also commissioning uh, content at BBC in the, in the previous life and the fundamental misunderstanding was always about production timelines and TV broadcasters and TV companies would go, yes, we need a, a digital thing that goes with this TV program. It was always an add-on um, and this was four or five years ago. And, but they never understood that actually to create, to craft this digital content and or this compelling game, you need quite a long time because it is a highly skilled and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a job that requires all sorts of different uh, skill sets, um, and it is a craft. You know, we, we, we in the games industry consider ourselves the new digital manufacturing. You know, that's what we are doing. We are manufacturing experiences. So one of the things that's come through, I think, from all the panelists so far has been something around being able to work in teams or work together with those who are perhaps expert in different elements. Mm -hmm. So whether it's working together to craft a product, whether it be uh, working with people who can identify incredible problems and helping them solve them. What does that mean for the way in which s this might w work in school? How do we support people to become digital makers within a school if such an important element is around teamwork and, and, and joint working? Absolutely. This, I, mean, I think the argument is stronger than it's important that we have these vibrant industries. Important as that is, it's much more about broadened horizons and liberal education. You know, we teach poetry in school. We teach making music in school. We take, teach painting pictures in school. Yet very few of our pupils going at careers in those domains. Similarly, surely, these days, because of how important it is in all of our lives, an understanding of code, an understanding of how the technology works, of how computers function, ought to be part of that liberal education. So how do you make it happen? How do you do the teamwork thing? By recognizing that this is the best way to acquire that knowledge, that understanding. You know, if we can accept it as a given that children ought to learn to do these things, then we move the debating to what's the best way to make this happen. And I think you know, we've, we've got to the point where we're getting computer, more computer science, to be fair. There was always some programming on the national curriculum. Um, we're getting more programming there. We're getting more computer science there onto the national curriculum. So that debate, we've kind of won. The new issue is what's the best way to teach this? And believe me, I can teach Scratch as badly as I've always taught PowerPoint. You know, <laughs> the, the trick is now the pedagogy. And what's that? You know, let's learn from the people who've already acquired that skill, that knowledge, that understanding, because they've been teaching themselves that, or they've been learning that from other people out in the informal, out in the semi-formal domains. And, and what are the recipes for success there? And that's why I'm really interested in the work that you've been doing about how 
children of, of or how people have got their sense of the class. Also because the, you skills. know every mm. class is different. You know, my mum was a school teacher, a primary school teacher, and you know, every new intake, she would take two weeks and she'd got the, 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 the sense of every single child in that class um, and who was gonna end up, you know, <laughs> doing what 20 years down the line. And you know, there are, it's, it's building that capacity of that understanding that every audience is different. And actually you might get a class that's not remotely interested in, remo in, in the Raspberry Pi, sorry, um, because it looks like a broken computer to some. Whereas they might be interested in this robot thing over here, or this makey doll that you can actually program to make it do something, and or a game, you know. And that is one of the insights from the informal and semi-formal education domain, that people there learn about what they're interested mm. in. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice if primary school children or school children and school teachers got Googles 20% of the time, that for at least some of the week, they could learn about and teach about the things that they were most interested in. That, that's a lovely point. How are we going to use that 20%? So we're, we're, we're rapidly heading towards wine, but we need to open this up now for, for questions and, and comments. Uh, this is being live streamed as well, so, so we'll run across with some microphones towards the front, please, Vicky, if possible. If we can see some hurtling. We'll try and direct you in different directions. So if you can come towards the front, please. Thank you very much. So, so questions and comments. So this gentleman at the front, please. If it's, if, do you want to just say who you are as you, as you ask the question? Yes, age and old, though, retired. Um, and uh, it was just a conversation I had a couple of years ago with one of the creators of Good, Ga Good Games, uh, David Braben from Frontier, and he employs PhD physicists and mathematicians and teaches them to program. So I think we ought to remember that quite a lot of the stuff that makes things work does depend upon some pretty hard-edged understanding of engineering and technology and mathematics, science. The good thing is that if kids come to realize in order to make somebody fall over realistically, they've got to learn a bit, we might actually make the learning of maths and science better. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. No, no, I think, what, are there any comments? Any, any responses to that? Hopefully you don't. Um, another Adrian, Adrian Smith, um, part-time entrepreneur, always trying to start things up. But also the hat that I've got on at the moment is for the Teacher Development Trust, which probably illustrates the direction I'm going to head in. So two themes, really. The first is about who should be doing coding and the breadth of it. And I have a passionate view that coding should be everywhere in the school curriculum. W when we start talking about where coding is, we, we tend to talk about the creative side of it, or we talk about computer science, but we forget that actually coding as part of the humanities or anywhere in the curriculum uh, can aid understanding. It goes back to the comment right at the start that making something aids understanding. And one of the things that we're missing in this country is a belief that actually everybody, ev everywhere in school should be doing some coding or some digital making. That's the first comment. Second comment really, which is I think the most important one, and picks up on some of the things Miles said, which is about it's actually all about changing the way teachers behave and the way teachers teach and we're only going to get a sustainable change here if we fundamentally transform professional development for teachers and actually make teaching a more socially collaborative um, endeavor and start looking at things like collaborative inquiry as the way to develop teachers not send them off on coding courses unless we do those things in a sustained way what we'll end up with is pockets of excellence and activity and CAS is a an excellent example of that. It's a good network, but it's, it's a network in pockets of the country. We need some sort of national initiative, which, which we're trying in the Teacher Development Trust to do, um, and to fundamentally transform how teaching happens. Because regardless of where it starts, it's the way teaching occurs that's going to make the fundamental changes. That was longer than I meant. <laughs> Thank Sorry. You. Yeah, I think we'll have to have two responses. I think it's aimed at Miles. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the te uh, there's a contradiction. Well, is it a contradiction? I don't know. Um, let's have com computational thinking. Let's have coding across the curriculum. That's easier to achieve in primary school than it is in secondary school. But then, how are you going to get all of the secondary school teachers able to teach that or able to faci facilitate learning in that? That's a, that's a real challenge. Um, it's not a solution, but it's a thought to put on this particular fridge door, which is. If we think that learning through making 
works for children and for those who are acquiring the skills, then let's do that too for the teachers. So please don't send them on the Python programming course, but let them build stuff using Python. Or, well, maybe not start with <laughs> Python, but let them build stuff for the web. Let them build stuff from scratch. I can code up a really nice drill and practice maths game. Problems with that we know in Scratch, or I can teach somebody to do that in a in relatively few minutes' time. And producing digital, again, long and noble tradition in the primary phase of teachers making things for their children to use in class. Let's just translate that into the digital domain and have them making interactive resources and games. Yeah. I mean, I was just going to add that I think it's incredibly important and, you know, it, the, the capacity, the confidence, and the sharing of knowledge with teachers is, is important. I think a DFE potentially needs to kind of step up to the plate in terms of CPD and, mm. and retraining. Um, but also, there's a big job for industry to do. You know, and, and um, you know, there's a big incentive now uh, with the six million pound skills pot across animation, high-end TV, and games that was announced last year as part of the tax relief, uh, tax credit that games industry and animation high-end TV are going to get this year, which is fantastic. And that means that you know, lots of schemes and initiatives like internships, or co coaching, reverse mentoring, after-school clubs, um, you know, helping to support things like uh, the Video Games Ambassadors Scheme that we run, which is getting industry professionals into schools and helping to build the capacity and the confidence and the knowledge is incredibly important. Industry can do so much um, when it actually does uh, focus on the job that needs to be done. Um, so I think that is the next stage. Um, and certainly in the games industry, that's, you know, well in the way, well on the way. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add that I think sometimes underpinning this discussion is an, uh, uh, is an assumption about, no, is a hidden debate about whether this is really about the production of elites. Okay, is this really a discussion about the production of a, highly, a minority, highly skilled workforce? And I've been uh, picking up on some of the things that Joe was indicating, although I would also suggest that if that's the case, then we've also got to take into account the kind of global workforce, which is competing for the kind of work that we're talking about. But is some of the discussion around kind of coding um, really about the production of a small segment of highly skilled coders in that kind of way? And I think that's what underpins some of the recent conservative kind of educational policy. Um, but if that's the case, then we need to be kind of honest about that and transparent about that. And we need to find ways of kind of situating that within the ways in which we normally talk about education, which is around equality and opportunity um, and, and the sort of more democratic and open senses. So I think some of these debates, there are, there are hidden assumptions there which need to be kind of teased out because it's not always been the case that the purpose of an education system is the production of sectors of the labor force. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not normally where we have schools in this country. On the whole, but it, we all seem to buy into this because it suits us for a variety of reasons. If we go down that route, there are going to be some consequences. But I think that's interesting. One of the, in fact, in fact, three of the reasons we talk about the importance of digital making, one of which is, is around the economics. One around personal creativity, and, and the third that we often talk about, especially at uh, Nominate Trust, is, is around the ability to participate within mm. socio-technological structures. Th those three things come together. Learning to become a digital maker helps you interact across all those three. So, so how, how important is that debate, then? It's an important debate. It's not, it's not something... I mean, I, I, don't, I haven't come across... People have helped me out here. I haven't really come across a lot of the literature or the work um, which kind of explores it in that kind of way, but I think we're being bounced into a discussion around um, the production, you know, which, which, which is about the purposes of education, an emphasis on the production of segments of the population as particular purpose, parts of the labor force, and not other kind of more democratic arguments. So I think we need to be careful about that as we kind of enter into that discussion first with some of this. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Tony. <laughs> no conference is complete. Thank you, Tony Parkin, as you might have gathered by the laughter. Um, I was interested in Miles' 20% Google time point, because according to government, of course, we only have 60% of curriculum time formally prescribed. Therefore, theoretically, we have 40% Google time rather than 20% Google time. 20%, and, 20%. And I, you know, we know that that's rubbish. I just highlight, I just wanted to point that out. But it seems to me, since the assessor, in, in secondary particularly, since it's always the assessment tail that wags the curriculum dog, 
is not a simple answer to this to actually come up with an absolutely bloody brilliant assessment routine for secondary education in the area of digital making, which will be so powerful that it would be really hard to resist it. So in other words, instead of trying to do it, I normally would go for the bottom up, the teacher education, all that, done that for 25 years, kept me happily employed. But realistically, if we were to come up with a really good exam, would not, not that do a lot to achieve what you're trying to do in a much shorter space of time? That's a fascinating comment. I'd love to hear some responses from the audience as well as, well as from the panel. Drew. Hello, I'm Drew Buddy. I'm a teacher. I'm a head of IT at a girls' school. And um, backing up what Tony said, you know, I'm currently teaching A-level ICT. And I put anyone who's heard me speak before knows that what I'm about to say, which is that the coursework my A-level, which is 17-year-old students is having to make for the Welsh board, um, coursework is a six-slide PowerPoint slideshow, uh, two document uh, mail merge with six, um, de six people's details in a database, <coughs> excuse me, and an eight-page publisher document. And to my, my you know, I, I bring copies of that around because people don't believe me. That is such a shocking thing that, you know, I'm, that there's no creativity in my A-level classes. So the exam boards that come up with that NAF course are largely to blame when, you know, when a lot of teachers or ICT in schools is getting knocked. In my belief, that's where the problem has lain. And, um, and uh, my GCSE class, um, uh, the ruination of that is this controlled assessment. Uh, so now I've got in the GCSE OCR course, I've got 20 hours in which my pupils have got to make, say, a website or a PowerPoint presentation or something. Um, uh, but the number of marks they get for making the thing is about four out of 60 marks. All the other 50-odd marks is writing about how they made it and the print screens that show all the steps they took to make it. That, in my opinion, is where the fault lies. And until that is cracked, um, the, the, whatever dreams anybody has about it being a fantastic world for, for creating and digital making, I have no chance of, of succeeding as long as exam boards have courses like that. Well, I think this, this is absolutely shocking. And I think this does require leadership as well, you know, from schools, but from MPs and from, you know, the whole body of people who actually do, you know, they do, well, you know, they do, <laughs> you know, when, when we talk to them about the problem of skills, and the problem with the, with the assessments, then you know they do understand and they are keen to do something about it. But it does require leadership from somewhere, and that's what I sense we don't really have. Okay, all, all the questions are coming just as we're running out of time. So we're going to have a really quick fire, one, two, three, four questions, and then we'll try and well, take, take the discussion to the bar, I think. Hmm. If we start at the back and work on a triangle, or, or a straight line, whatever that is. Um, hi, I just wanted to ask a question about kind of what you do for digital making for the young people that have already left education, but you know, they're commonly referred to NEETS, because one of my concerns is from a youth and social work perspective, we've got incredible people who love to work with young people, but they don't have the skills themselves, they don't know how to get them. Um, say for myself, like my background is youth kind of development, but I don't know how to code. I'd rather that I did know how to code, because sometimes you can't get what you need and you never get the financial resource. So I feel like there needs to be not just in education, but training on the social and youth work, and just wondered what ideas you had, because we want to help, we're creative, but we don't have the skills to deliver. Thank you. Fantastic. The next question. So, so Joe, I think that's a question for you. I think it's just like, actually, Hello, uh, actually, Joe, this is a response to what you were saying. Um, now, my fear is, with the Nesta report that just came out uh, two years ago, <laughs> the politicians have just got on the computer science programming bandwagon. And when we put the, uh, the new curriculum through, it was a lot more creative than the one that's popped out the other end. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm really heartened to hear that you guys are looking at animation and other things in, in your next step in what you're doing with, with Yuki. Um, was, is that correct in what you're saying? And um, maybe if you get their ear for that too, then we'll get well, a more balanced Yeah, curriculum. I mean, we always started off the Next Gen Skills campaign off the back of the Nesta report with a whole set of recommendations. Only one to four have been done, um, which was actually, so we consider ourselves almost like a, a pre-alpha stage in game-making terms, which is, okay, we're, we're, we're starting to look at the curriculum and, and in a formal way, and that's not us, by the way, that's just the, the, the coalition, the campaign of industry. Um, the next stage is much more detailed than that, you know, and it is about these mix of skills. It's exactly what we've been talking about in terms of how um, people are inspired and learning collaboratively. 
Um, so it, it has to be uh, around creative skills, artistic skills. You know, the report was co-authored by um, Alex Hope from the, the special effects industry. So it's all, you know, we're, we're very closely tied with that um, in terms of the skills asked. But it's absolute critical importance those mix of skills are in every kid's uh, grasp. And I think particularly um, the, the point about NEETS is extremely important. You know, as part of that Next Gen Skills report, the kids were asked, uh, um, sorry, it was, uh, I think it was to do with the Gaines Britannia um, uh, workshops that run up in Sheffield, but asking a whole bunch of kids about their favourite games and where they were made, like Batman Lego, Batman Arkham City, mm. Grand Theft Auto, although they shouldn't be playing that if they're, they're <laughs> under 18. Um, but they, they all thought that they were made in, in, in uh, America, they thought they were made in Japan. And likewise, you know, I think I was at Digital Shoreditch uh, last year, and you know, you have all these kids on the doorstep, on the doorstep of these most creative technical industries, uh, technology-driven industries, with so many career options open for them, and they have no idea about them. You know, and the careers advice at schools, um, you know, the careers advice, careers advisors <coughs> are, you know, the, 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 the career pathways and the knowledge about these opportunities, particularly in lower socioeconomic um, uh, areas, is appallingly bad. And that really needs to be fixed. And I think I need to chat to you after this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, is there one other question? Yeah. And we'll end up at the top. Hi, Octavia Hurst. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that I do think this is a pedagogical problem more than anything else. Because you mentioned um, people creating poetry and music, but that pretty much doesn't happen after primary school. Um, what they do is analyse poetry and music. And I think that unless they can be given the opportunity of creating and creating digital things. There's really no point in even having the discussion because they'll just be analyzing something. And that's not really what we're talking about here. Yeah. So, yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Brian Fogdelli. I think I'd just add a comment, and it's, it's not necessarily even, Tony and I know each other a lot, and we rarely disagree, but we sometimes occupy similar spaces. I think it's, I think it's the two-prong, and I think it's what I think the Nominate Trust does, because it is about persevering both in the practice and the theory. And so in the same way that I, I live in hope and think we should be looking for new assessment models and leadership from our, from our politicians, et cetera, the time it will take to accept that we will be able to assess things that recognize what you've been talking about, which is the collaborative and failing as well as succeeding and the creativity and creation as well as the analytical means that what you've said, I think, in your report, that it starts from that innovative extracurricular space that we're working alongside. And I do think there is a will for teachers that do want to, to be part of that collaborative creative movement. And I think it's linking into what you're saying with the ambassador movement. What we're finding, um, I work in Apps for Good, and while we're putting people in teams and letting the students begin to collaborate and create their own solutions, which they want to do and they will do with or without us, we can also, it, teachers do want to learn, but how can they possibly keep up with a field that the experts struggle to understand? And that is where I think we start throwing open the doors of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And we have our experts in working with the students directly while the teachers learn while that's happening. And so I think it sounds daunting, but I think it's exciting because what we have within it is a model that's transformational for education full stop, mm -hmm. not just what's happening within the field. Mm -hmm. that, that's such a wonderful call to action. We're going to have to end there, but we'll pick, pick up further questions and comments in, in the bar in a minute. That, that, for me, that's a really exciting end point because it's, it's full of possibility plus realism. That there's a wonderful sense of kind of slight dissatisfaction with the way things are going, but real opportunity to do something about this. That there's so much kind of energy around digital making at the moment. There are so many people in this room who can help one another out. But I hope this really is just the start of, of making more of what's going on already. I, I've alluded a number of times to us working with, uh, with uh, Nesta and, and, and Mozilla. And part of that work is trying to make visible some of the activities that are already taking place through, through um, Make Things Do Stuff, which you'll hear more of, I hope, uh, as time develops. But it's really important we make these more apparent so young people can get inspired and engaged in these sorts of activities, whether that be in the classroom or at home with friends and others. But I think if we hold on to some of the key terms that we've heard about today, kind of dissatisfaction and the demand for change, the creativity, not just kind of learning about particular processes, but how all these different aspects come together, then there really is something very, very exciting we can all get behind. There's wine downstairs and beer and opportunity to, to keep on talking. So please do keep on talking. 
Before we head off, can I just say thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you to those who, who have tuned in online as well. And can I ask you all to say thanks to Julian for a fantastic report and to the other panel members for their discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.